everyone. Thank you for returning to our third Wednesday programs. I'm Miranda Chirac, the educator at Rome Historical Society. And today we have our very own executive director, Arthur Simmons. And he's here to tell us about fortifications on the United Carry, which is now Rome, New York. Um, so Arthur, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Good morning. Good morning. And so you are usually sitting behind this wall next to me and I can usually hear you, but you're not here today. So where are you? I'm at home. I'm at home. Yeah. Yeah. This is the home office. That's right. Good. Yeah. It's good to see you virtually. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. You know, sometimes we're talking through the wall. I don't know what that's all about, but. <laughs> For video production, it's probably better. So. Um, yeah. I want to remind everyone we're offering our third Wednesday programs virtually and we have been since September and looking forward, we plan to continue virtually until at least June of 2021. So um, just a reminder to like, comment and share these videos so we know you're watching and you can get our most up to date information about upcoming programs on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Rome Historical or on our website, romehistoricalsociety.org. So check those out. Uh, if you go to either of those websites, you can also donate to Rome Historical Society and all donations will help with future programming like this. So please consider it because every small donation helps. Um, and thank you for your continued support. So on to today's topic, Arthur, we have the great Fort Stanwix, which is a few yards behind me in downtown Rome. But there have been a lot of other important fortifications built right here in this area. So I'll turn it over to you and you can tell us all about that. Yeah, so uh, a little backstory, um, you know, uh, as you mentioned, Fort Stanwix is probably the, the, the most famous uh, uh, of all the fortifications uh, that were built on the carry. Um, but there were many others and, and that, you know, Kind of going back into my journey, you know, uh, growing up here in Rome, I did not know the story of the other, of the other fortifications. So, so to 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 discover that was uh, and has been quite an, an adventure, and um, you know, it's one of the lesser known stories uh, of Rome's history. Um, so, my journey really has started uh, started probably around two thousand ten, two thousand. 11 um and you know from diving into archives to to being in the field with archaeologists it's 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 been it's been an amazing journey um so and this presentation today um is is uh based on uh, one that i did up in at fort ontario in 2019 um and and part of this uh uh, part of this, again, this journey has been because of the support of all, all the friends along the way. Um, uh, so I can't, can't thank them enough. They know who they are, so we don't need to shout out individually. But um, yeah, so, so uh, let's, get, uh, let's get right into it. All right, I'll share your presentation. Yeah. All right. So, you know, the competition for resources and the desire to uh, influence the Native, Native Americans in order to gain uh, access to the land and those resources resulted in um, conflict breaking out along the borderlands, separating the two European powers of France and, and Britain and North America. Um, next, next slide. Uh, two of the earliest uh, events uh, that were, were tra really triggers um, for conflict were uh, the Battle of Jamunville Glen and also the, uh, the Battle of the Great Meadows or Fort Necessity in uh, 1754. Uh, and as a result, uh, tensions rapidly uh, intensified on the continent and uh, the scales tipped towards full-blown full war. Uh, uh, with the British deployment of Major General Edward Braddock uh, to North America in 1755 with an expeditionary force of um, 2,200 troops uh, of the 45th and 48th regiments, which were uh, raised in Ireland. Um, and after arriving on the continent, Braddock would call a meeting uh, of the colonial governors at Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, and uh, 
they would set four main uh, objectives for the upcoming campaign. Next slide. So the British plan to gain control over the continent was to attack the French uh, in Nova Scotia at Fort Beauséjour, uh, in Northern New York uh, at uh, Crown Point, um, uh, on the uh, Western uh, frontier of New York uh, uh, at Fort Niagara, uh, where the Niagara River empties into uh, Lake Ontario, and then uh, in the Ohio Valley at Fort Duquesne, which you know today is uh, today is uh, Pittsburgh. Um, so next slide. Uh, the expedition, which was to be led, uh, the, uh, the Niagara expedition, which was to be led by Massachusetts Governor William Shirley, uh, was intended to lay siege and take, uh, and take Niagara. Um, and then ultimately, he would, uh, General Braddock, after t uh, taking Fort Duquesne, uh, would also rendezvous with him. Um, and this would, this would deny uh, French the access to the Ohio Valley and again those those resources in the inner part of the continent um, set to launch from Niagara which had been established as a trading post in 1727 primarily to counter the French establishment of uh, Niagara a year earlier it was not actually until 1755 that the British sought to use Oswego as a place to launch uh, offensive operations from um, but in order for Shirley to do that, he had to get his forces there first. So next slide. So the trade route between Oswego and Albany was really the only functional highway to uh, and from the, the Great Lakes that the British could use during the 18th century. Uh, men and supplies would, uh, would first go over land 16 miles utilizing the Kid Kings Road uh, between uh, Albany uh, on the Hudson River in Schenectady on the Mohawk. Um, once at Schenectady, they would load their, their bateau uh, or small boats and then travel up the Mohawk River some 58 miles until they reached Little Falls. And, it, you know, it's important to note that uh, this 58 miles had 57 rifts or rapids uh, in, 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 in the Mohawk river. So, um, and some of them were only inches deep. So that, that alone was a challenge. Um, once at little falls, they were required to portage the bateau about one mile, um, often aided by the, the German Palatines who lived in the area, um, before placing their, their bateau back into the river and continuing another 38 miles uh, and through another 22 sets of rapids um, to the Oneida carrying place. Um, here they, uh, they were again required to portage, but this time over a, a strip of land uh, located uh, between the Mohawk, which flows uh, east and Wood Creek, which flows west. So in the distance across the Oneida carry, uh, was anywhere between two to four miles, depending on water levels uh, of both uh, the Mohawk and, and Wood Creek. Uh, once it, in Wood Creek, the bateau would then tra travel the shallow, um, narrow winding, uh, and often, as the name implies, uh, log choked uh, creek uh, some 18 miles out to Oneida Lake. Um, and from there, they would travel across the lake, often using the North Shore as it was um, uh, shallower uh, onto the Oneida River uh, and there from from the Oneida River they would travel the Oswego River uh, make another small portage uh, at the Oswego Falls which is present-day uh, Fulton New York and then finally arrive at Oswego so it was quite a journey but you know only 22 miles of that was by land um, so the rest was, was all by water and, uh, you know, and that's, that was the way you, you got around, uh, in the 18th century, you utilize the, uh, the water, uh, waterways. Next slide. So, so yeah, the bateau, um, they were essentially, uh, the pickup truck of the 18th century and they could, uh, carry a cargo of about 1500 pounds, uh, depending on size and, uh, they were often constructed of pine, um, sometimes 
uh, sometimes not lasting more than a season, um, you know, from scraping across, you know, through uh, the rocks and those rapids and everything. And um, they, they range from 20 to 30 feet long. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is uh, they, they, they drew really no more than 15 inches of water. Right. So, so you could easily, you know, figure, figure, you know, a hundred pounds per inch. Right. So if you, if you got into the, the narrow sections of, 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 uh, or excuse me, the shallow sections of the waterways, you know, it could become manageable because these boats didn't, you know, again, they didn't, uh, they, they didn't go very deep into the waterways. Um, there was sometimes a swivel gun mounted, uh, mounted to the bateau, um, and, uh, and a sail sometimes that they used for, for open water. Um, next slide. You know, in, uh, in talking about the portaging, um, you know, it, it, th they adapted over the years. So when you're, when, when we're talking about 1755, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, what I'll call infrastructure in place. Uh, so, uh, so there was, there was a lot of, uh, a lot more effort needed to, to, uh, that had to be put in to, to get these bateaus, uh, across these portages. But later on, um, uh, the British were using, uh, drays, which essentially, you know, uh, it's a bateau or a, a, a boat trailer, right. You know, uh, whether they could load the bateau on, onto it and, and, and portage it that way. Um, the other thing that they would do is they would, uh, unload the bateau, uh, put the supplies in wagons or, or, or use sleighs and then uh, transport those across these portages and then reload the, the bateau uh, later. Um, I do want to point to the, the picture on the lower left. That is actually a bateau in uh, Wood Creek uh, in the 1990s. So that gives you a sense of what, you know, what that would have been, been like for, for them in the, in the 18th century. And then, so. In the top picture, they have like wheels. Is that what you were talking about? How they would move yeah. the boats? Yeah, yeah. the dray. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. All right. Yeah. Next. Yeah. So, um, in the spring of 1755, with the anticipated launch of the Niagara expedition, um, William Alexander, who was William Shirley's secretary, uh, reported the following. A number, a number of people are at work in Wood Creek and on the carrying place to mend the passage there. We're talking, just talking about that infrastructure, right? Uh, which was the most needful to Oswego. Others are to be employed in making passages in the shallow rifts in the Mohawk River. And I have directed two storehouses to be built, one on each end of the carrying place of strong logs covered and floored with bark. Uh, one... Uh, 35 feet long, 20 feet broad, uh, and these will be sufficient and, uh, and the cost of them trifling, but it will uh, be of great use to some of the men to encamp at each of these houses uh, until the, the stores are carried over. So, so they're, they're, they're basically, this is the beginning of the, the um, uh, building of a supply line. Right. Um, Alexander goes on to say, and this is, you know, remember, this is part of a, a British expedition that's going to be launched against the French, right? So he goes on to say, the French in Canada are not the least surprised or apprehensive of any attack from the ish, uh, from the English, but on the Ohio, and we just talked about Fort Duquesne, and to the eastward, um, which would be Crown Point. Uh, the troops going to Oswego is, uh, is looked upon only as a reinforcement of that garrison. Um, so uh, going back to the, the storehouses, uh, William Johnson, who was uh, the British superintendent of Indian Affairs, uh, believed that the construction of the two storehouses would really displease the, the Oneida Indians. And uh, so as a result, you know, he, he let William Alexander and, and William Shirley know this uh, and said, you know, hey, we need to, we need to, we need to hold off on building these until we, we get consent from the Oneidas, which, which was obtained in, in July of 1755. So next slide. As fate would have it, uh, the British plans uh, would fall dramatically short. Um, so while there was some initial success with the capture of Fort, Fort Beausjour, again in Nova Scotia, 
Uh, everything else really came undone, uh, especially with, when the French killed Major General uh, Edward Braddock uh, and decimated his his expedition uh, uh, at the Battle of the Monongahela um, in July. They also captured the, the British plans of operations. Um, so with that defeat, Governor William Shirley actually becomes the British commander in chief for North America while he is en route uh, with his troops to Oswego. Um, the expedition, the, the Niagara expedition itself would have many setbacks um, and Shirley would end up struggling securing the bateau and the supplies he needed to get uh, to get his force from really from Boston to to Oswego. Uh, and in fact, Shirley would write uh, from the Oneida carrying place to uh, Thomas Robinson, who was the uh, uh, leader of the British House of Commons and, uh, and their secretary of state. Uh, and he said the late arrival of the uh, deputy paymaster of the forces for the Northern District at Boston made it impractical to march the soldiers of my regiment from thence uh, until the 21st of May. Their march to the place of embarkation uh, for Albany and their voyage to there and their march and transportation of the artillery and uh, military stores, uh, provisions and baggage from, from thence to Schenectady took 22 days. And their transportation from, from thence with the artillery and in bateau up the Mohawk River through Wood Creek, across Lake Ontario, through the Onondaga or Oswego River, um, all of which for the greatest part against strong currents and abounding with falls, rifts, and shoals uh, make a difficult navigation. Um, so, you know, and he goes on to say, you know, together with, um, with the delays occasioned by the three carrying places uh, where they were obliged to unload uh, uh, the bateaus, um, and transport with the sleighs uh, by uh, using horses and afterwards reloading them um, and the necessity for um, dividing up his troops into eight divisions on account, again, for, of, of needing the bateaus to transport them, um, all contributed to a delay. Um, so he had, you know, when he wrote this, he actually had already known that, that they, were, they were going to be... Uh, 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 it was going to be very difficult for them to launch uh, to launch against Niagara in 1755. Um, so Shirley arrives in Oswego in August, and and as I mentioned, by October he and a council of war uh, had determined that that uh, that it was really unsafe uh, for them to go out onto Lake Ontario that time of year with these small small bateaux. Uh, and, and again, just uh, uh, decided to postpone until the following year, um, leaving some 2,000 men there to winter quarter. Um, so I don't know how many of the people watching this have been to Oswego in the winter, um, <laughs> but um, you can Google that and <laughs> it'll, tell you, it'll tell you what that's all about. So um, yeah. <laughs> Snowy, windy, and cold, huh? right? Oh, that's right. That's right. So. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Okay. Yeah, and this is just, you know, this kind of is a breakdown of how the troops were distributed through that winter. So we have the 50th uh, Regiment of Foot and the 51st. Now, they, they were both raised in, in Massachusetts and the uh, New Jersey Regiment, uh, Schuyler's Regiment. There was about 500 uh, men in that. Uh, and so we also had, you know, uh, Oswego, of course, is a, is a harbor. Uh, so the British had some small warships that they were building out there. Um, uh, so, and that, and that actually, you know, there was, there was a lot of cannon that were, uh, were coming through here uh, to, to be placed on those warships. Um, so, but yeah, about 2,200 men in Oswego and, and around 300 uh, here at the Oneida carrying place. And of course there would be more distributed down the, the Mohawk Valley as you get toward, uh, uh, toward uh, Albany and Schenectady. Uh, so next slide. So in order to help secure the, uh, the long supply line, uh, which was again, providing that, that support, uh, in late October. And after again, seeking permission from the Oneidas, uh, Captain William Williams, 
who was in command of the carry, was given the order to enlarge the storehouses uh, that they had erected earlier in the year and enclose them with, with pickets. So this is really, um, this is the creation of, of, of Fort Williams and, and Fort Bull. Um, so there were some other uh, improvements that had occurred that were occurring on the carry, including, um, you know, the clearing out of Wood Creek and, and making it, uh, uh, you know, easier to navigate. Um, uh, there was uh, there was quite a bit of uh, marsh and, and and wetland around, uh, so they were uh, they they worked on building a bridge over the place they called the morass. Uh, where that is, we're not a hundred percent sure. But um, uh, the other thing that that um, and when you look at the correspondence of the t- uh, at that time, um, uh, Colonel Colonel Mercer, who was in command at Oswego. Uh, actually sends uh, uh, sends uh, a, an officer and 30 men to reinforce Williams on the carrying place. Uh, and uh, I suspect that that was actually uh, Lieutenant William, uh, William Bull. Um, so, uh, yeah. So next slide. So after the... The British plans being captured, uh, uh, the uh, at the Battle of Mon- Monongahela, uh, again where General Braddock was killed and his force was uh, defeated. Uh, along with that knowledge and uh, the knowledge that more than two thousand troops were were garrisoning uh, were garrisoned at Oswego, and that the British were establishing fortifications on on the Kerry. Um, this obviously didn't please the French. <laughs> uh, so uh, the French governor, uh, uh, Vaudreuil, uh, decided to task Lieutenant Gaspard uh, Joseph Chalce Gross. I do my best with mm-hmm. that. Uh, Deliri, uh, he will be Deliri going forward in this, <laughs> in this presentation, um, with attacking the British supply depots at the uh, Oneida carrying place, uh, believing that uh, this would decimate the already starving uh, garrison at Oswego. Um, and in fact, the, the harsh winter conditions and them, them uh, being cut off from the supplies that were being stockpiled here at the carry, um, mainly because Oneida Lake was frozen and Wood Creek uh, was also frozen. Uh, as many as a third of those men out at Oswego would uh, would be dead by the springtime. Um, so uh, Deliri sets out f- uh, with his 362 men uh, from the French mission uh, of uh, La Presentation near present-day Ogdensburg uh, on March 12th, 1756. And after a two-week journey uh, through the wilderness uh, of northern New York, uh, he arrived at the carry on March 26th and set up a camp in a pine grove uh, just north of, of the carry road. Next slide. So yeah, the next day at 4.30 in the morning, Deliri sends out scouts. And at 9.15, uh, they return with uh, prisoners, two prisoners. Uh, next slide. He interrogates the men and learns that uh, the post on the west uh, west side of the carry or closest to Oswego was named after Bull, um, the lieutenant in command of it. He also learned that uh, 70 men uh, were garrisoned there. Um, uh, 12 men were camped outside the fort, probably bateaumen, guarding 15 bateaux, which were loaded with uh, supplies destined for, for again, Oswego. Uh, Deliri also learns that the post on the eastern side of the carry or closest to Albany was called Williams, after Captain William Williams, that 150 men were in garrison there and was protected by four mounted uh, cannons, uh, probably swivel guns, and another 150 men were camped nearby. Um, He also would learn that uh, Sir William Johnson, with an additional 400 men, could arrive uh, at the carry within a day's time, and that a convoy of supplies would be leaving, uh, soon be leaving Fort Williams um, to travel across the carry uh, with supplies destined uh, for Fort Fort Bull. Next slide. 
So uh, Deliri also desperately needing supplies for his men uh, who were uh, starving after the two week journey uh, uh, decides to have his native allies uh, silently ambush this, this convoy of, of sleighs uh, uh, as it was, uh, as it was crossing the carry. And that ambush takes place at 10 AM and results in, in, in them getting, uh, getting the supplies they needed uh, to sustain, sustain their uh, themselves uh, on the return journey North. Um, however, during the ambush uh, one uh, one man escapes and is spotted running toward uh, Fort Williams. Uh, so uh, knowing that the British would soon be alerted to his presence, Deliri then made the quick decision uh, to move against Fort Bull, which was the weaker of the two uh, carry forts, especially since it had no, no cannons. Next slide. Um, so yeah, unable to convince uh, his native allies to accompany him. Uh, they basically saw this as, you know, Hey, we came down, we, you know, we ambushed this convoy. We got what we needed for the return trip. We don't want to go attacking any forts. Um, you know, so there was, there was a little bit of uh, division uh, in his force. Um, so Deliri decides to split the force and leave those who would not follow him on his flank. Um, and uh, to protect it, and you know, it would as fate would would have it. This this tactical decision probably saved Deliri's forces from defeat because the 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 man who escaped the ambush uh, indeed made it to Fort Williams and reported, uh, "quote that our slaymen uh, were all taken by the enemy." Um, so, with Captain Williams hearing this, he sends out a small force to in investigate. Um, and apparently they had gotten, uh, when they went out, they had gotten to about a quarter mile from Fort Williams. Um, and they were met with heavy fire and forced to, to retreat with at least one of them uh, being captured. Um, and I do want to, uh, that individual, his name is uh, Robert Eastburn. And he would later write um, about his experience. Um, so I just kind of, just kind of kind of read some of that right now because yeah. it's it's it really it it really is telling as to just how uh how brutal the warfare was uh at that time and and and, and so um he writes in this difficult situation so remember he's in the sortie of british that are going out you know uh and uh, seeing a large pine tree near i i repaired to it for shelter and while the enemy were viewing our party, I had a good chance at killing two uh, at one shot. Uh, quickly, just uh, quickly discharged at them, but could not certainly know what execution was done. So he doesn't know if he missed or, or whatever. Uh, uh, but he would say, uh, sometime after our company um, likewise discharged and retreated, uh, seeing myself in da danger of being surrounded, I was obligated to retreat a different course and to get and to my great su surprise, fell into a deep mire. So I was talking about this wetland, you know, um, which the which the enemy by following my tracks in the light snow. So I know there was light snow on the ground on the carry on twenty seven seventeen fifty six. All right, um, soon discovered and obligated me to surrender uh, to prevent a cruel death. They stood ready to drive their darts into my body in case I refused to deliver up my arms. Um, after I was taken, I was surrounded by a great number who stripped me of my clothing, hat, and neck cloth so that I had nothing left but a flannel vest without sleeves, put a rope on my neck, bound my arms fast behind me, put a long band around my body, and a large pack on my back, struck me on the head, a severe blow, and drove me through the woods before them. It is not easy to conceive how distress, distressing such a condition is. In the meantime, I endeavored with all my little remaining strength to lift my eyes to God. Wow. Yeah, yeah, really, really powerful. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so let's go to the next slide. So, Deliri... Um, you know, he, he had split his force and um, 
Yeah, he had split his force and basically said, you know, hey, we need to sneak up on 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 Fort uh, on this fort. Um, fort Bull was not alerted to to their presence yet. Um, so they got to a couple hundred yards um, to within a couple hundred yards of the fort and um, his native, there were a few natives that did follow him and apparently they had gotten into some rum when uh, that was found in the supply convoy um, earlier. So they were, they were really excited and they got to within a couple hundred yards and let out a, a war whoop. Um, and at that point, you know, everyone at Fort Bull uh, knew that it was, um, you know, that it was on. And so um, they approached from, uh, from the East and uh, Deliri would say, uh, I place, uh, I find, I find the door closed and the enemy in defensive positions, firing briskly and throwing a quantity of grenades. Uh, and I place my, I place my detachment at, uh, uh, at the, the door of the fort. And I set the others to the corner turrets, which the enemy had neglected in order to defend, uh, uh, in order to defend. And so um, at this point they start chopping, you know, trying to, to chop at the, the the main gate and trying to, to bust through. Can you go to the next slide? Mm-hmm. You know, and an hour later they do, they do indeed break through. And uh, he, uh, Deliri would later report, I entered the fort with my detachment crying, long live the king. And I, I cannot restrain the soldiers and the Canadians. They kill everything that gets in their way. Um, mm-hmm. Next slide. Yeah. So he goes on to say, I'm the master of the magazine. I have the kegs of powder dr- uh, dug up and thrown into the water. So, so they, they dug up the, the, the powder from the magazines and, and got them outside the fort and were dumping them into, into uh, Wood Creek um, along with uh, many of the, bo- the, the, the bombs and, and grenades and bullets and, and all the provisions they could, they could find. But when this happens, uh, fire catches a house and uh, he says, I hurriedly caused my detachment to leave the fort. I draw away fearing the effort of powder. I am only four arpents away, which uh, when it blows up and in three separate blasts, um, about one second apart. And the shock is so terrible and the force so great that uh, almost all of my detachment is shaken and overturned by it. Um, it's estimated that 6,000 pounds of gunpowder um, uh, exploded during the attack. Uh, next slide. So after that, Deliri would then rendezvous with the rest of his force. And, uh, and, and again, with them having defeated uh, the sortie out of Williams, they retreated. Uh, with their loot and, and, and prisoners. Um, so next slide. Deliri would later write in his journal, and I, I think this is, this is, it's amazing that we even have this today, right? Um, he says mm-hmm. the commander of the fort was named Bull, for which the depot had taken its name. Uh, he was a lieutenant of the regiment of Shirley and defended himself with all the courage and bravery I have always remarked in English officers. I gave him two chances to say if he wanted to surrender, and I made him an honorable offer, but he only strove all the more ardently to defend himself and was killed only when the gate of the fort fell, still trying to defend the entrance. I had his body put aside in order to have it buried, but when the fort blew up, it blew the, uh, it, it also blew to pieces and was scattered uh, like the rest. Uh, and we do know uh, from uh, a report a few days later that um, one of Deliri's native um, ally, uh, allies was actually found a couple hundred yards from the fort. So, um, you know, and again, that just, you know, the, the effect of the, that explosion. So, uh, next slide. You know, I'm of the opinion that this um, this attack uh, would would ultimately deny the British ability to conduct any 
uh, effective operations on, on Lake Ontario for two years. And, and with this slide, you can see some of the, um, you know, you have British losses of 51 killed at Fort Bull, six outside of the fort, 13 taken from the, are uh, killed from the, the sortie out of Fort Williams with 35 uh, taken prisoner uh, with very, very light uh, uh, casualties on the, and, and only two deaths on, on the French side. But you have, again, this is all about supplying Oswego. It's all about, you know, um, keeping, uh, making sure they have what they need to live. Um, so when you're talking destroyed a 16 bateau, 30 horses killed, um, you know, uh, as we mentioned, six, 6,000 pounds of gunpowder, uh, exploded, an estimated 14,000 pounds was dumped into the Creek and, uh, along with clothing and, uh, and equipment and food, uh, you know, from everything from chocolate to, to uh, barrel, 15 barrels of rum. Uh, so, uh, very, very effective uh, attack. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, let's go to the next slide. So just a few weeks after Deliri's raid, uh, the British set to replace Fort Bull with a new, more substantial fortification, which would be, uh, which would come to be known as Fort Wood Creek or sometimes Fort Eagle. Um, uh, and this was uh, this was laid out by engineers McKellar and Sowers uh, as they were in route to Oswego, um, and uh, it was situated. And I quote from the British plan of Fort 1759, uh, It was situated where Bull's Fort formerly formerly stood before being destroyed by ye enemy. Um, so it was completed by uh, Major uh, Charles Craven, uh, who uh, who had replaced Captain William Williams as the commanding officer on the on the carry, uh, and it was a stockade fortification with a ditch uh, or moat along three sides, and the fourth being a pond, which was which was filled when the gate of the dam in Wood Creek uh, uh, was closed, uh, and dams were used along Wood Creek to assist, uh, assist the bateau with, with traversing the, the shallow portions. Uh, so the idea is that upon opening these, these gates, the bateau would be carried by the rush of water downstream. Uh, and in this case, they'd be headed out to Canada Creek, um, which uh, took them, <laughs> it's interesting, they say it's, it's like four miles, but it's, it's four miles because of the, how windy and twisty the, uh, Wood Creek is, um, but it would take them about uh, 45 minutes uh, to travel. So uh, in straight line distance, it's, it's two miles. Um, Fort Wood Creek uh, would be garrisoned by uh, 150 men uh, of Schuyler's New Jersey Regiment, or the Jersey Blues, and it would be under the command of, of uh, John Parker. Um, so now this site today is uh, owned by the Rome Historical Society. Um, and later, um, well, basically in its history, because of its, its proximity to where the original Fort Bull uh, was, uh, it, it is often, and, uh, and even to this day, referred to as Fort Bull. Um, the actual location of the original Fort Bull is, is, not, uh, is not known at this time, uh, but it is, it is basically just, you know, either directly under this four or maybe a little to the left or to the right. Um, uh, but you could, you know, you could uh, reach out to us, you know, when the weather gets good and, and uh, you certainly can, can go out to this site. Um, you can still see remnants of the dam, the dam uh, today. Uh, all the bastions and the moats are all intact. So it's a, it's a really amazing site. And, um, and uh, one that has been uh, under, uh, uh, um, has been, uh, you know, we've been conducting some archaeology out there through the uh, public archaeology facility of SUNY Binghamton of late. Um, so there's some really exciting stuff um, there. So again, if if anybody wants to wants to go check that site out, just uh, just reach out to the society and we can we can make that happen. So next slide. Yeah. So another uh, fort constructed in 1756 was midway across the uh, Oneida Carry, and it was named uh, Fort Newport. Uh, and this was a, uh, 
a stockade fortification with a ditch around it. Um, and it was located about one mile west of, of where Fort Williams uh, was. And uh, this is on the uh, upper portion of, of Wood Creek. Uh, well, or what is now today the upper portion of Wood Creek. Uh, this was also constructed by Major Craven, uh, and it was built uh, to receive the supplies uh, that were being across, uh, brought across the carry from, from the Mohawk River. Um, there was also a dam with a floodgate built here, uh, which upon opening would, would again help propel the bateau uh, that were staged in this wharf. And you can see, uh, I just want to mention that in this picture, north is down, by the way. So, with, uh, the top of this picture, which is south, you see this wharf, um, and uh, that's that's man, the general vicinity of uh, of Erie Boulevard, uh, west uh, west here in Rome, um, uh, modern day De Castro's restaurant and uh, mm -hmm. general lumber area, um, and uh, but uh, yeah, so so the, uh, bateau was staged there, uh, and uh, and then of course they'd open the gate. Uh, uh, the floodgate uh, at the, with the dam and uh, they'd ride the wave down to, to uh, Fort Wood Creek. And then from there, again, with the dam there, they would, uh, they would ride out to Canada Creek. And once they got to Canada Creek, there was almost always enough uh, water, um, uh, water that, uh, and then when I say Canada Creek, that's where Canada Creek dumps into Wood Creek. So there's, there's a significant amount of water there and they almost always had enough to, to navigate the rest of the way out to, to Oneida Lake. Um, so the, the straight line distance from, from, from this site to Fort Wood Creek is 1.8 miles, but they would say um, by the Creek, it was three miles and it would take them about a half hour uh, to do that. So um, today, really the only thing that remains of this site is, uh, is a, um, well, it's not even really remains, but there's a state historic marker that, that uh, is uh, just to the north of where this site would be today. Uh, next slide. Fort Craven, um, originally dubbed the Pentagon or New Fort. Uh, and of course, this is uh, named after Major Charles Craven. Um, and it was an intended, intended to replace Fort Williams. Uh, and it was constructed of logs laid horizontally uh, and tied with cross beams, um, they say nine feet wide. Uh, and then it was filled uh, using, using dirt, which was, um, was dug from a ditch that was around it. So it's, it's almost very similar to, the, to the, the construction of the original Fort Stanwix, but, on a, but not uh, on the same scale. Uh, the ramparts uh, were 10 feet high, but there was an additional seven foot high parapet was, that was also intended to be constructed, um, although they say it was never completed. So, I mean, I, if they had done that, the walls would have been 17 feet high. Um, uh, the bastions were intended to house magazines, but uh, in the summer of 1756, only one of the bastions was, was full of provisions. Um, so next slide. So with the initial completion of all these, these forts, uh, there then came word uh, to Captain John Parker out at Fort Wood Creek on the far right of your, of, of your screen that Oswego had fallen to the French. Uh, Parker would send the following uh, message to Charles Craven, uh, presumably in, in Fort Craven. Oswego is taken and all the officers and men made prisoner prisoners. Uh, Colonel Mercer, uh, uh, Colonel Mercer is killed, and I have it from one of your regiment uh, who made his escape. So when news of us, so, so when the news reaches uh, Craven, he orders four cannons to be, uh, which were intended for those uh, for those boats out at Oswego. Uh, he mounted those cannons to the bastions of of uh, Fort Craven. Uh, he then sends word to uh, General Daniel Webb, who was en route uh, to reinforce Oswego. Uh, and with, when Webb received Craven's letter, he then writes the following to uh, Lord Loudon, who is the commander, who is now the commander in chief of British forces in North America. Uh, and Webb is, in, is at German Flats, by the way, which is um, Herkimer today. Uh, I have ordered the 44th Regiment and 116 of the independent companies to get ready to march as soon as possible. I shall make the utmost expedition in getting to the great carrying place 
As soon as I come there, I shall set about making an entrenched camp uh, of as much extent uh, as the nature of the ground will admit. And I shall wait with impatience for your Lordship's further directions. So um, just, you know, on the slide, if you look uh, basically in the middle um, there, you'll see a, an area that's, uh, that is marked Webb's encampment. Uh, so that's that's where he he ultimately ended up uh, being uh, when he arrived here, and it was probably um, it was probably they probably used gabions, so it would have been like branches that were uh, were turned and filled filled with uh, basically looped and then filled with with dirt um, and provided providing you know minimal amount of protection. Um, so. Uh, when Loudon uh, got word, and of course he's in at headquarters in Albany, he responds um, uh, first by ordering uh, Sir William Johnson with a thousand militia uh, to reinforce German flats, um, and then he writes the following to 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 Webb. And this is really important because Webb's subsequent decision has often been been criticized as he as. Uh, uh, maybe being panicked uh, at the time. So uh, Loudon writes, I think your situation a dangerous one, and yet it absolutely necessary for us to keep possession of as much of the country as we possibly can. And if, if by your intelligence you find that the enemy is coming against you uh, with a force you are no ways able to resist, uh, in that case, it will be necessary to harass the enemy in their approach. And if you are forced to retreat, you will destroy all the forts you leave behind. Um, so, and, and uh, next slide. And that's what he does. Um, so he burned up all those forts? He burned up all those forts. So, so just, just to kind of recap, right? So Fort Williams, first fortification built on the carry, um, uh, followed by Fort Bull, both um, which were really fortified storehouses constructed the fall of 1755. Fort Bull is attacked um, in March of 1756 and utterly destroyed. And then Fort Wood Creek, Fort Craven, um, Fort Newport, and Fort um, and Fort Williams are all there. Um, really, less you know, all less than a year old. He burns them all down and he retreats to to, to uh, German Flats or present day Herkimer. And and this and they would not return until 1758. So. Um, I would say the the French, the French achieved their goal, right? Um, so that, yeah, let's go to the next next slide. So uh, the British plan of seventeen fifty eight, you know, they were they they desperately needed to reestablish themselves on, on Lake Ontario. And remember, Oswego had fallen. Um, so General James Abercrombie uh, ordered General John Stanwix to the Oneida Carrying Place uh, to build a substantial fortification there. Uh, and while doing this, he, he also ordered Stanwix to send a secret expedition uh, to, against the French Fort uh, Frontenac, which is on the north side of Lake Ontario, basically opposite Oswego. You can see that on the far left of, of the slide there. Um, and this mission was going to be led by Lieutenant Colonel John Bradstreet, who was in charge of the, of the batowmen along the river. Um, and he, he really was uh, a master of early amphibious operations um, and was very, very familiar with the terrain. Um, so uh, uh, this expedition would, all, would, would be success, uh, successful. And it would disrupt the French supply line to Fort Niagara. So it's kind of like Fort Bull in reverse, you know, because the French supply lines all along uh, the St. Lawrence River. Um, uh, and, and it would indeed have, uh, have a rippling effect on, on the French garrisons uh, to the west uh, and, and south in the Ohio Valley. So 
Next slide. So uh, the first, the first task, you know, arriving at, at the carrying place in the beginning of August of 1756, Stanwix orders the ground cleared of all the brush that had grown, uh, uh, grown over the the the, the, the past two years. Uh, and then needing to protect himself, he ordered uh, defensive earthworks constructed around uh, around his camp and the charred remains of Fort Craven and Fort Williams to be re rebuilt. Um, having established these positions, Stanwix would then, of course, have his engineer uh, go and uh, survey the remains of General Webb's uh, encampment. Uh, from 1756, which was, again, located about a quarter mile uh, to the north. Um, uh, while this is occurring, he, he would uh, split his force and, and the raid on Frontenac would occur. Um, and then the rest of the, the rest of the troops would be uh, left to, uh, to construct Fort Stanwix. So next slide. Yeah, so um, Fort Sandwich construction began August 23rd, 1758, and was not completed until around 1762. Uh, and it was built on a bluff, um, basically where Webb's encampment was. Um, it cost in today's dollars about 8.6 million. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the perimeter was uh, uh, 1,450 feet um, total, and there was four bastions, uh, while 17 feet high, 18 inches, uh, yeah, excuse me, 18 feet thick, uh, and built of squared, squared logs. Uh, and of course, it had a, had, had a dry moat uh, 40 feet wide and 14 feet deep. Um, and capacity um, was really uh, about 400 um, maximum. Uh, and, and again, to note here, Sir William Johnson, he, no, he negotiated with the Oneida Indians to obtain their consent. So that was such an important thing uh, back then. It's still, still an important thing. Um, so, but it, it's interesting that the, in this case, two promises were made to the Oneidas, and that was that the fort would be demolished at the end of the war and that there would be plentiful and cheap trade. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. All right. So, uh, the magazine, uh, was located in the Southeast Bastion and it could hold about, uh, 2000 barrels, uh, or roughly, uh, 200,000 pounds of, of powder. Next slide. The necessary was an ele was elevated uh, and, and located just off the southeast bastion. They did not reconstruct this uh, in the 1970s, so you won't see this today. Um, and uh, as my understanding, there was no incident uh, with it being with its proximity uh, to the powder magazine. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, so there was uh, barracks uh, that were uh, located underneath the north, east, and west ramparts. Uh, and again, the garrison could be uh, between two and, and 400 men. Uh, some of the early uh, uh, maps showing Fort Stanwix, circa 1758, 1759, show a bunch of like little squares in, on the parade ground of Fort Stanwix. Um, those were actually tents. Um, that they were using uh, while the while the barracks were being constructed, so they were just camp they were just camping out on the parade ground. Yeah, next slide. And actually, there you go yeah, on the left. There you'll see all those all those little tents there. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's interesting to note that that despite construction beginning in 1758, it wasn't until uh, 1759 that embrasures uh, were, were placed on the north uh, the northwest bastion of the fort and and as late as 1760 had not been placed on on the uh, on the other three um, and uh, you can see there on the top right you know what an embrasure is so it's basically you know this V section of the 
of the of the fort that you know allowed uh, allowed the cannon to be able to to fire out at various angles. Um, and 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 even the walls, uh, you get uh, the orderly book of the 78th Regiment, um, February 5th, 1759, says that each company is to fill with sand the barrels which they receive their provisions. And you'll see there at the bottom uh, a graphic that uh, that they were using these barrels uh, uh, as protection and placing them, them up on the walls. Yeah. Next slide. So I going to mention the, the Royal Block House and you'll see, see on the map it's way, way out on the right there. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was built on the South shore of Wood Creek where it emptied into Oneida Lake. Um, and it was designed uh, by Colonel Montresor, who was a, an engineer and, and, and it was used to support uh, the Niagara expedition of 1759. So, um, it was a post for uh, 150 men, and uh, there was an entrenchment around the blockhouse, which was, of course, located in the center. And it also had flankers on each side um, with mounted swivel guns. Um, um, but that post in particular would go on to serve uh, and support operations well into 1764 um, and would be abandoned uh, in 1766 and was accidentally burned in 1767. Um, but I, I put this on there because it's really, you know, it, it, it's really part of, it's part of that network, right? Um, and so, you know, as you're moving from uh, through these waterways, every, all these fortifications are supporting each other. Um, uh, so another four, and this is here in the middle here, um, of the of the slide is uh was built at the junction of wood creek and canada creek uh and this would be fort ricky and of course today we know it as like the the game farm um and uh this area as i mentioned earlier was 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 uh they almost always had enough water uh to to uh to uh use uh to to be able to float their bateau down down wood creek um, and it was used by the military and traders alike. Um, and, and actually post American revolution, there was, uh, uh, there was an, uh, an, a tavern that was erected in, in that general area. But yeah, Ricky was constructed in 1759, again, to support the, the, the Ni uh, Niagara expedition. Um, and, uh, it was, uh, Captain John Rickey was in command and he again was part of Schuyler's New Jersey, New Jersey regiment. Uh, and there were uh, a, a bunch of batsmen that, that, that were, were there to support, support those operations. Um, the original Fort Rickey um, only lasted four, four months because it too was burned in 1759. Uh, we don't know under what circumstance, but, um, some say the Batomen were were very upset and uh, had not received their pay, so they burned down the fort. Um, so while there isn't a whole lot of information, it, it does it is said that there was another um, fortification built there, but very very small, um, and maybe only uh, twenty men in garrison. And it would have they had a dam there as well. Um, I don't know how much they they you you know needed to use it, but um, but they certainly wanted to keep that supply line uh, intact. Um, and then one of the one of the things going back to the the Fort Bull Fort Wood Creek story is you know so again we have Fort Bull built and then destroyed very quickly, and then we have Fort Wood Creek built and destroyed very quickly. So the, one of the questions has been well was Fort Wood Creek ever regarrisoned? And, and you see on this, uh, on the left there, there's, um, there's uh, the work that was being done in 1759 uh, at Fort Stanwix. And uh, in addition to, to them talking about, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the blockhouse and, and Fort Rickey, um, they talk about uh, building a floodgate uh, to assist the navigation of bateau at Bulls Fort. And again, it was commonly called Bulls Fort. 
So we know that, that the British were using uh, at least the dam in 1759. Now, whether, whether the fort was uh, repicketed or, or that, we don't know. So, um, yeah, and so with all, all of these actions combined with the establishment uh, in 1759 of Fort Brewerton and Fort Bradstreet out on, on the other side of Oneida Lake um, and the British returning to Oswego, um, uh, which would result in the capture of Fort Niagara and Quebec in, in 1759 and the fall of Montreal in 1760. Um, basically the French and Indian war, or as they, they call it in, in, in Europe, the seven years war is, is over in North America. And uh, in large part because of uh, the, the, the supply line and the fortifications that were, were, were here on uh, the Oneida carry. Yeah. That's it. That's it for me. Last one? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, Fort Stamwix today. Yeah. Um, it's ama an amazing site. Um, it's a, it really, really is. Um, and such a, uh, you know, to be able to, to go to, you know, a site like Fort Stanwix or some of the other, um, the other sites that are part of this story, Fort Ontario, um, you know, Fort Niagara, even Fort Ticonderoga and, um, you know, and, and, and see what life was like and, uh, you know, uh, and, and to, to see the scale, uh, to which these four fortifications were constructed is just, um, it's, it's, it's really great to be able to have that. Um, so many of these sites are, um, you know, they're long gone. They're long gone, uh, uh, either destroyed by, you know, uh, you know the, the name of progress, you know, with when, when canals were built in their vicinity or, or just, you know, cities growing up on top of them. Um, so, so what we have, and, and, and again, Fort Stanwix is one of those sites. It's just so, so special to have it. So, um, yeah. You got any questions for me, Miranda? Um, well, I was going to ask you what happened to any of the other fort sites. Um, have they been excavated or are they just kind of built over at this point? Yeah. So, and I just kind of alluded to uh, the, the, you know, the, the Royal block house. Um, it's our understanding that that any, any remains of that went away when the, with the, the building of the barge canal early 20th century. Um, fort Ricky today, um, the mount, the, 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 the hill where the fort was, uh, uh, there's a small structure that was, was, uh, was built there, uh, to support the, the, uh, the, the zoo. Um, I think there might be spider monkeys hanging out there. I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. It's been, it's been a couple of years since I've been out there. Um, you know, of course the, the, where the creeks, uh, Canada Creek and Wood Creek come together, um, that area has not really changed that much. Um, uh, uh, for Wood Creek, as I mentioned, uh, you can still see those earthworks today. Um, and, and, and it is being studied, um, for Newport, very, very little, um, then that area was, uh, uh, that area was, you, you had Fort Newport in, in the French and Indian war. Uh, it was also that, that, the ruins of that fort were used by uh, St. Ledger in uh, uh, the siege of Fort Stanwix in 1777. Um, and then you also have a, uh, the canals that all kind of came together there, including the, the Western Inland Lock Navigation Canal um, and uh, the Erie Canal uh, groundbreaking occurred just to the south of that. And then, of course, the approved canal uh, was there. Um, so there may be some... Uh, resources still still there in in the ground um but to my knowledge there has not been any archaeology or anything anything done of that area however it is in the city's historic district um so so that's that's good it offers a little bit of protection um and of course fort stanwix was reconstructed um and it is uh it is on the site of the original fort stanwix mm -hmm. uh well, all right, maybe a few inches off, but yes. <laughs> pretty pretty close. Yeah. I think that it's great to have 
um, Fort Stanwix and you can go and experience it. But I think it's equally as important to tell the story that you just told in this program to make all of the connections come together. So yeah. I think the combination of both is really important. And um, Fort Stanwix, like you said, is reconstructed and it's kind of surrounded by modern day Rome. Um, mm -hmm. It's an interesting uh, contrast. But then we have, you know, Fort Bull site where you can go and see uh, it's right by the pond and, and remnants of the carry road. So that's also an interesting site to visit. And like you said, I would encourage people to go there because I think it's great. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, you know, real quick, I'll, I'll finish up, you know, just, uh, just south of, of, uh, of Fort Sandwich today uh, along uh, Whitesboro street, uh, uh, there's two historic markers uh, that were awarded to the Historical Society in the City of Rome through the uh, William G. Pomeroy Foundation, and they mark the approximate location of Fort Williams and, and Fort Craven uh, there on the eastern side of the carry. And, and again, that area was, was, you know, it's been changed so much. The, the improved uh, uh, channel of the Erie Canal, mid-1850s, uh, went right through that area. So, um so, but when, but when you walk it, when you walk from, from, from say, you know, the site of Fort Craven uh, and, and experience it all the way over to, to Fort Wood Creek or even Fort Rickey, and uh, you really get a sense of, of what the carry was all about. And, um, you know, it's, it, it really is such a, uh, the story of transportation uh, here in Rome is such a huge story and the contributions not only to, uh, to, to, American history, but really global history, especially when you start talking about uh, the Erie Canal, uh, is just amazing. So, well, I want to give you a round of applause, Arthur, for for giving us that presentation, and I really enjoyed it, and I hope that our audience did as well. Um, and I want to let everyone know if you have any questions about this program, feel free to put them in the comments of this video, and we will answer them directly because uh, we'd love to talk to you more about this. Um, Oh, and for, again, for more information about our upcoming programs and other exciting things coming soon, keep an eye on our Facebook page and our website. And don't forget to share this video. So thank you again, Arthur, and thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you, Miranda. Bye, everyone. Bye.